first thing maybe to kick off, um, one thing that strikes me in particular as a historian watching this is that clearly a lot of thought went into the historical accuracy uh, of what you, what you depicted here. Um, one of the main sources would have been the uh, so-called scrolls of Auschwitz. These are um, writings by members of the Sonderkommando. I don't know if any of you here have read them. These are writings by prisoners of the Sonderkommando, which they buried in 1944 in Auschwitz itself. And some of these were found after the war and obviously used by you and read by the actors. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about other sources which you've drawn on, both historical maybe, but also literary or, or film. Historical a accuracy was of paramount importance for this project, and I always considered it to be uh, the anchoring uh, point of, uh, of the film. It had to be as, you know, as uh, closely, um, you know, you based as closely as possible on, 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 the, on historical facts. And I, oh, oh, you know, when we, even at the level of the screenwriting uh, with my co-writer, Clara, we, who is, by the way, also a historian, um, we always wanted to uh, know whenever we would be able to take some liberty with the, with the material. But we wanted to c follow as closely as possible uh, the facts. And first, the, the documents of the Zonderkommandos themselves, the so-called Scrolls of Auschwitz, which are an incredible read. I think they're re really not very well known, but uh, these these documents are incredible. But before that, actually, I read um, uh, the the testimony, the book of um, because the, because the Zonderkommandos are dead. These the Zonderkommandos who who wrote the the, the, the scrolls are, are dead and were killed during most most of them during the uprising. But um, we also based the film in a way on um, on the testimony of uh, of a Hungarian uh, doctor who survived, who was the assistant yeah, of Mengele. Nisli, yeah. Nisli, yeah. He he was uh, Nisli was uh, assistant to Mengele in in Birkenau, and survived and went back to his uh, to Transylvania. And, and wrote in '46 the book of his uh, um, everything that he remembered from Auschwitz. And when I read that book, it was an incredible um, that that was something that I never um, imagined that uh, that Auschwitz was like that. You know, we have an image of of the concentration camp, but when you read this kind of text or Zonder Commandos, then you have an entirely different vision that, that's presented to you. I mean, let me pick up on that then. I mean, the, the, the question of how to translate these writings into a film or this kind of, this experience into a film is, is obviously incredibly daunting and difficult. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that because clearly there are any number of very, very bad films about the Holocaust and about the camps. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if he could, I mean, I can think of two or three films off the top of my head, which I might not mention here. Mm. Um, but I mean, could you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? And maybe also what you learned from these films about how you didn't want to approach this subject? Well, it's always good to have negative examples when you approach a film. We uh, we considered that we really wanted to, to, to immerse the viewer in an experience and and not trying to uncover uh, too much of the context of the main character, not trying to illustrate. We wanted really to uh, um, to give a visceral uh, experience of the concentration camp. So that included the limitations, and that had to include the frenzy, the uh, the babel of languages, the uh, um, the 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 mixture of chaos and organization. Uh, and these aspects, I think, were not, uh, were, were not, uh, haven't been uh, present in cinema, or, or very, very marginally. Um, in cinema, you there's a tendency to present the audience with the story of, of the survivor, uh, the story of the exception, in a way reassuring the audiences, and also 
from a, a visual strategy point of view, you uh, there's a tendency to uh, to um, to illustrate, to give establishing shots, to to use editing as a sort of way to relieve the audience, uh, to um, uh, to present the audience with the obligatory signs of the concentration camp or the Holocaust. And w what my assumption was from the beginning, and uh, and really the um, my feeling is that when you arrive as an individual into the concentration camp, you you know much less than that. So why cinema? Why why does cinema have to give so, so much to illustrate and 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 give so much information, whereas the individual cannot have access to this kind of information? So I really wanted to take the viewer to uh, to the heart of the extermination to to see what it was. Uh, the concentration camp, the extermination camp, whereas today, it, you know, the Holocaust became a sort of abstract notion, um, whereas it lies, I think, in the, in the, in the heart of, of, of the, this modern civilization. Why do you think it has been so difficult to, to tell the story from the perspective of the dead, if you will? Maybe we're not close enough, or, or um, uh, maybe there was too much uh, tendency and willingness to um, to give relief and um, to reassure. I mean, that actually raises another question in my mind, which is about Soul's quest in the film. I mean, some people have read his effort to provide for a decent burial for the boy as somehow redemptive in that way. I mean, that's not how I read it, um, not least because his s determined uh, quest puts some of his fellow prisoners into immediate danger and actually leads to the death of some of them. I mean, so it is, it is much more complicated than wow. redemptive. Well, I mean, how do you understand his his quest? I mean, what was the what was the? Or, or do you have a do you have an explanation for what Saul does? I think I, I'm I'm not really willing to um, to give a manual to my film. I thought you. Um, I I'm thought reluctant. I caught you off guard I'm reluctant. With the spilling of the water. I know, incident. I know, but it's it's symbolic. I'm it's um, um, I um. I'm getting to. I'm trying to get rid of all these questions, you know. Um, no, I'm. I'm. I really think it, it's be between the viewer and the film, mm. and the viewer and Saul, in a, a in an ideal situation. If if I succeeded, what I wanted to do is it becomes um, the question uh, between the audience and mm. and the main character. Uh, does it really make sense? Does it can you know it raising the stakes in the story? Can we still stick to the main character mm. uh, in this place where um, not only people are killed on on an industrial scale, but also their very history is being erased? A man who is trying to give back history to one individual, to give one individual story to uh, to one. I think that's that's the m most meaningful act that they can remain. So these people are dead, in a way. So what they what can they do? Is there still a voice inside uh, these people that can exist? Um, yeah, these are these are the things that come to my mind. You have given me an answer now. Right. Um, I mean, how did the you talked at the beginning about the, the earlier idea of your conception of what you tried to do or wanted to do. And I just wondered how, it was obviously a, a, a process that you went through till you got to the final film of trying out different techniques, strategies, um, you know, different scripts and so on. I mean, how, what, what, what changed in that time in a way? Or how, how, did, how, did, how did the process from the initial idea to the to the end product change what you what you what you had in your mind early on or did it stay fairly no i, I think it stays for fairly um um the same 
uh, when I set out to make this film, I knew that it wouldn't be a, a traditional coverage film with the establishing shot and close up and you know medium close up and whatever, uh, you know the usual thing. And um, I knew that it had to be it had it would had to be very closely associated with the point of view that's uh, that's very limited and and very narrow. And so I wrote the screenplay with my co-writer uh, with having that in mind. I mean, one striking... I mean, it's easy to focus on the cinematography in a way because it's so striking, but actually I found the sound just as affecting in many ways. And kind of... So that, that idea was also there from the beginning too. Yes. yes, yes. And we talked about it, about the sound extensively from very early on. And then it became a huge post-production in sound, the five-month... And, and and layering, you know, the voices, the uh, in different languages. So there's something that I uh, um, that that was there from the beginning. Although obviously, you know, more you know more elements came into mm. the uh, into the film. But uh, uh, when we did the sound, I needed more background voices all the time. So we asked the actors from abroad to send us in different in Polish and. You know, in German, all kinds of uh, orders and voices and things like that. So we we really want, and it it just became a huge um, enterprise of of, of sound of dialogue editing mm. and things like that. Well, kind of talking about dialogue and voices, I think this is a good time to 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 hand thank you um, to hand over uh, and take questions from the audience. So if you could kind of raise your hand, and I think we we'll, we might take two or three, and then pass it back to you if that's okay. Was is this really your first feature film? <laughs> According to uh, the internet, yes. <laughs> no, it is. Astonishing, on ev even if it was your fifth, but um, specifically, were you looking for in your main actor who's in every frame close up? Uh, that's something that I discovered while making the film that he he is ordinary and extraordinary at the same time. I mean, this is more an intuitive process when you're casting, but it we, it becomes uh, when you keep looking at your the faces that you have in the film, you you discover elements that are you know, put words on 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 things, and uh, and I think this is it. Uh, while making the film, it it came to me that uh, soul, in a way, um, embodied by this person seems to be an ordinary person who becomes a, almost like a saint you know like um, um, someone uh, uh, could be anyone but at the same time carrying out a sacred uh, task so my question would be about the character of soul yes uh, how did the character come about and was it how far along were you in the process? Uh, what were you looking to kind of tell through him? And also you said in an interview that the casting informs the process of writing. And once Geza came along, um, did he inform the writing process as well? And did he change the character or was it already there completely? I, I, I really have no. I have a hard time, to, to, you know, separating the uh, the layers. When, once they're done, it's hard to to go back and do the archaeology of the project. Uh, I th yeah. In in this case, the casting was very uh, uh, was very um, was very long and helped us inform the screenplay and change the screenplay. Usually, simplify simplify the dialogue, simplify the situations. Uh, we had more backstory uh, of of this under commando members, but then um, uh, but then it it became evident over the course of the casting and more after in the rehearsal before the film that these people these people in this under commando have no have no past, they have only the, the present. So um, so for for that reason we had to we had to just take take out all the information and explanation and and the elements of their previous lives um, and and 
but I have to say that the main character, although it was we had a little bit more information, wasn't we didn't have a huge backstory. But for example, in the scene with the um, with the women, uh, there was a dialogue initially between uh, between Ella, the the young woman, and Geza, suggesting that there was a sort of uh, uh, at some point, probably in the camp, some f some f form of contact or affair or something like that. It's just that it became obvious that this kind of scene and scene design, this kind of logic was not allowing us to have this sort of establishing of backstories and subplots that, that would take just too much time. And in in the uh, logic of the concentration camp and the way um, this this character was in a f constant state of frenzy, we couldn't allow this to happen. My question would be really to find out from you what your main motivation for making this film was um, and how long you worked on the film. Uh, basically, uh, I worked... I th let's say 10 years but but it's it's my first film so it doesn't you know it's a different way of counting uh, i had to make short films and um, it took a lot of time but uh very actively let's say five years um and um the main my motivation was being uh i really wanted to uh to 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 show to show today's viewer in a visceral way what the concentration camp uh, felt like something of the voice of the uh, of those who who went through the process I wanted there's something the the vo that something that they had inside but couldn't express otherwise to be heard in uh, today. Uh, yeah, thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. I felt the part of the film that felt most real was the way the Sunder Commando kind of interacted with each other. The very terse, broken dialogue and the way they're constantly kind of pushing and shoving and moving away from each other it felt kind of like a, almost like a dreamlike. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know how you worked with the actors to achieve that effect. It's very sort of unemotional, but quite affecting I had to convince the actors uh, from many countries by the way uh, that um, they didn't have to use the usual uh, uh, acting strategies that really we were uh, trying to find a sort of um, very low-key form of existence Especially because these these people are already dead, uh, and that they're in the um, really in the center of of hell. So how do you achieve that? Uh, you cannot be. I I think you cannot be. You cannot fully recreate that, but you can hint at this, and um, and and I really wanted to to reassure my actors that. It's it's okay not to have any kind of emotions um, that the the mo the kind of emotions that they wanted to um, to produce in different circumstances um, that this had to be much more um, much more reduced and restrained. Um, it's it's a very basic uh, form of directing. I have to say it's um, it's. Um, um, it's like when my, with my main, main actor is almost like you know joystick directing. You know, you go to the left, you go to the right, but then obviously you have to you have to in, intervene and pay attention to all the uh, um, all the little um, you know uh, variations and 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 constant uh, temptation of the actor to 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 do things that had no place in this film with that i think kind of what more fitting uh, end could we could we could we uh, hope for for this 
Thank you very much. Sasha, well, thank you very much. Kind Thanks of, for I think coming. Before we kind of. Thank you.